I find it interesting, don't you, how people have the ability to take a wonderful experience and ruin it? Isn't that interesting? We as humans are so good at taking something that should just be wonderful and just lowering it and lowering it and lowering it to the point where, eh, it's ruined. You know what I mean? Okay, may maybe you don't have this gift, but I certainly have the gift of being able to take things and ruin them. Um, I'll give you one example. My wife could give you a hundred probably, but I'll give you one. Uh, Lacey and I years ago were given a gift card to a very nice restaurant, and we got to enjoy this date night at a nice restaurant. And so, you know, it probably cost someone a decent amount of money to go to a nice restaurant. That's why I try to steer clear of places like that. But if someone's paying, man, I'm all for it. That's great. But right off the bat, my wife had to explain something to me, and I should have figured it out. She said, hey, it's a nice restaurant. You have to dress nice. And I'm like, what? And if you don't know me that well, uh, th this, you know, church t-shirts, they're great. I mean, good old t-shirts, maybe some jeans, but formal dress is not, it's not something that I look forward to. You know what I mean? It's Every time I put formal clothes on, it's just a reminder of how much weight I've gained. You know what I mean? It's, it's just not something that I look forward to. But you're supposed to dress up for a nice restaurant, so I'm kind of primed to think, oh, fine, whatever. So I dress nice, and we go there, and it's a very formal environment. I'm just like, you know, I'm not allowed to say certain things here. Do I have to act a certain way? It's kind of strange. And then we sit there, and then they bring, they bring the food, and it's covered with this massive dish, you know, this dish cover. I don't know what you call that thing, a big lid on top of the food. And they set the food there, and then they, and they paused for like a second. It, it felt like hours to me, but it, it, they paused for like a second. And I'm just thinking, what am I supposed to do here? Am I supposed to like, yay, good job, food? You know, am I supposed to be like, whoa, amazing? I, I don't know what. May, maybe you can understand this experience. I just don't get it as much as I should. But I don't know what I should have been thinking at that moment. I will tell you what I was thinking. My first thought was, that's it. That I, I go to this nice restaurant, somebody probably paid lots of money so that I could enjoy this meal, and this huge covering, you take it off, and there's this tiny little amount of food here? Like, what, what is up with that? Something's not computing in my own mind. So you can just see time and time again, my expectations were coming in, and they were just devaluing what should have been a great experience. Now, when I look back and I reflect on that experience, I have to admit, the restaurant didn't do anything wrong. They were living up to exactly what they were supposed to as a very nice, proper, formal restaurant. It was me. I came in there and I brought all my personal attitudes, my personal expectations into this thing. And because I brought that in there, I dramatically devalued, I dramatically reduced something that should have been great. Now, I want you to hold that thought for a second because that's the thought I want us to have when we go into the book of 1 Timothy. We're starting a brand new series today, and it is on the books of First and Second Timothy. And in order to understand that, we have to have a little bit of background. Who is Timothy? Timothy is a young convert to Christianity. Young convert, maybe late teens or early 20s. We're not exactly sure. We know he was a young man when Paul meets him. Paul encounters him in Acts, the 16th chapter. This young man has become a Christian because of the influence of his mom and his grandmother. His dad, as far as we know, is not a Christian, and he's not even a Jew. Everyone's aware of that. Paul finds out about this young man, and everyone speaks so highly of him. They say, Paul, this is such a great young man. He would be a perfect companion with you and your missionary journeys. So Paul checks him out, and he agrees, yes. I need to bring this guy along. He's the one that's going to help out with me trying to spread the gospel to all the nations around the world, the ones that Paul could travel to. Now, I've been on some short-term missions trips. Any of you been on short-term missions trips before? Got some people? Okay, cool, wonderful. Now, when you're getting ready for these things, uh, I don't know about you, but I had to get my passport squared away. I had to make sure I was up on my shots and do certain things. But Timothy... Timothy's dad was not even a Jew, and Paul knew that he was going to be traveling to a lot of heavily populated Jewish areas, and they are not going to have any respect for someone who is not sensitive to Jewish customs. And so Paul basically says to Timothy, Timothy, in order for you to go on this trip, you're going to have to be circumcised. Now, I don't know what you went through for your missions trip, but I'm thinking that proves one thing. This kid is committed. 
You know what I mean? You know he's committed to missions, right? He's willing to go through with that, and he did. He went through that. Paul circumcised him, and he was able to travel with Paul on this missionary journey. They go to a major port city called Ephesus, and they spend some considerable time there. And Paul acts like he wants to spend even more time there, but he wants to move on. So he leaves his, this young man, Timothy, there in the city of Ephesus to speak to them. And that's where we pick up in the book of First and Second Timothy. In the book of First Timothy, Paul seems as though he's jumping the gun. He, he's biting the bullet. He's just so eager to write to Timothy because he has some, in special, some special instructions for the people of Ephesus. And to summarize his basic, the way I would summarize his instruction is this, don't devalue the church. Don't devalue the gospel with your own expectations. See if you don't see that. We're going to pick up reading in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, right from the beginning. We're going to read through the first 11 verses real quickly. All right, here's what it says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and from a good conscience and sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for righteous, for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, those practicing sexual, homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Do you get a flavor when we read through those verses that Paul is eager? I really get this flavor that Paul is eager to, to, to command Timothy, warn these people. You've got some people in the church that are trying to bring up some stuff that just does not fit. They're trying to insert their own expectations into the gospel and in a sense, they're just going to ruin it. Paul is warning Timothy, and by extension warning all of us, watch out for law. Watch out for law. He has a bit of a lengthy discussion there about law, and you kind of wonder why is he talking about that? Why is that such a big concern? That sounds like something that the old church went through, but this modern-day American church in the 2000s, I don't think that's such a big deal. <laughs> Hold on a second. Um, when you think about the gospel, there are so many different words that you could use to describe it, right? You, you could use the word life. You could use freedom. You could use grace. You could use love. All kinds of good things, right? All kinds of buzzwords, if you will, that describe this amazing gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know there's one word that you can't use? The word is fair. You ever thought about that? The gospel is many things. I mean, the, go the gospel is how we get into heaven. It is how we have a right relationship with God. It's how we've been made right. But the gospel is not fair. Think about this. Jesus lives a perfect life, does absolutely nothing wrong, and yet he's taken to the cross where he, he dies such a painful death that they have to develop a new word in the dictionary to describe how painful it is. That's where that word excruciating comes from. He dies that torturous death even though he's perfect, and you and I are not perfect, and yet we get treated as though we are. That's not fair. Now, I don't know about you, but me from a very young age, fairness was kind of instinctual with me. 
Truthfully, I don't even think my parents had to teach me. I think somehow, some way, I knew life should be fair. It's just kind of my nature. My sister got a candy bar. Where's my candy bar? Why is she getting good stuff, and why can't I get the good stuff? I mean, you ask kids from the youngest of age, they pretty well know life should be fair. Fairness is just kind of the way this thing works, right? I think God kind of ingrained that in us. We understand this sense of justice, this sense of balance. This is kind of the way it should be, and yet along comes the gospel, and it throws everything out of whack because it's not fair. Now, if you leave humans alone long enough, if you leave me alone long enough, and I'm not constantly checking in with the Word of God, trying to stay close to Him, do you know what's going to happen? I'll tell you. I will slowly revert away from the good news of Jesus back to my own personal system of fairness. Because that's instinctually right with me. I'm comfortable with it. I'm used to it. See, if you leave me alone long enough and I'm not constantly paying attention to what God's word says, my instinct is going to be, well, sort of like this karma-like thing, this idea that do good and good things will happen, do bad and bad things will happen, because that's fair, that's balanced, and that seems to be the way life works in so many areas. And so I will, in essence, start taking the gospel and I will start introducing some sort of fairness principle to it, some sort of balancing of the scales, you know what the Bible calls that? The Bible calls that law. That's law. Now, it might sound a little confusing because when the Bible uses the term law, it's, it's loaded with meaning. It can have multiple meanings. See, sometimes when it talks about the law, usually it'll say the law. You know, oh, we're talking about the law of Moses. The first five books of the Old Testament where Moses gave the law to Israel, we know that is the law, and so we refer to it as the Old Testament law, or the law, the law of Moses. But there are plenty of other times in the Bible, all throughout the book of Romans, and we find it here in Timothy, where God uses just the blanket term law. He doesn't say the law, he just says law, and I'm telling you, when I look at this thing, I don't think he's just talking about the law of Moses. I think he is talking about any form of standards, any form of law. In other words, anything you do in order to make things fair, or make things right, anything that you have to do in order to earn a right relationship with Jesus, anything that requires your action in order to earn a result of morality, any system of fairness like that is a system of law. We got to watch out for that. Picture it this way, okay? I don't know if you're a theme park person or not, but can you pretend that you are just for the sake of illustration? Pretend that you love theme parks and there's one in particular that you've been dying to go to. You just can't because it's so expensive you'd have to sell a limb or something to get there. You know what I mean? That's how expensive these things are. But then someone buys you and I a ticket and we get to go. And if you don't want to go with me, go with someone you like. That's fine. It doesn't have to be me. But anyway, you get to go to this theme park that you're like, oh man, I actually get to go to this thing. That's amazing. And so you get there, you have your ticket, and you're a little leery. You're thinking, I don't know if this is going to work. This park is so expensive. I sure hope this ticket's right. But man, right from the get-go, it doesn't disappoint. The atmosphere, the environment, the music, the, the, the ambiance, everything just looks so good about this place. And then you walk up to the counter, well, counter, the, the check-in place, and they scan your ticket, and they say, yeah, welcome, come on in. You're like, yes. And then a worker comes and says, hey, are you Seth Bourne? Yeah, that's, that's me said, hey, I'm your guide. Come with me. I'm like, what? I get a guide? What is this, like a VIP ticket or something? I didn't even know they had it. This is sweet. So we're following this guy. You know, he's taking us, and he's walking towards that restaurant. Not the restaurant I opened this sermon with. That's a different story, right? But this is a restaurant that you actually want to go to, that you're excited about, but you knew you weren't planning to go there because it's a little outside your budget. You know, it's a pretty, pretty pricey place but you're thinking, maybe this is included. Maybe it's some sort of a package deal or whatever. So he takes you into the restaurant and he's walking up beside the line. And you're like, whoa, this is going to be great. But he walks past the line and he veers to the left a little bit and there's a hallway there. You walk down the hallway and he opens the door to the men's restroom and he props it up with his hand. He says, come on in. And we're thinking, that's kind of weird. We walk into the men's restroom wondering, okay. And then he goes to a closet, comes back, brings a mop, 
brings some cleaning supplies, and he hands it to us. And he says, all right, I just need you to mop this floor. I need you to start scrubbing these counters. Oh, uh, I'm a friend. And so we say, hey, listen, I'm sorry. I think there's been some sort of a mix-up. We're not employees. We're, this is not our first day on the job. We're actually here uh, as guests of the theme park. We wanted to enjoy the theme park. You know, we, we're not the new guys you hired. I think there's been some sort of mistake. And the guy says, oh, no, 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 no mistake. You're Seth Bourne, right? You, can I see that ticket? This, yes, yes, this is you. Uh, trust me, this is the way it goes. It's fine. Just clean this, and then we'll move on to the next thing. It'll be, you're going to have a great experience. And I'm thinking, well, this is really weird, but okay. So we go along with it for a little bit. Yeah, getting really cautious. We clean the bathroom. We're done. Doesn't take that long. The guy praises us, said, oh, you guys did wonderful. Oh, come follow me. This is going to be good. And so we're following him, and he's going to that ride. You know, the big one. Uh, it, for me, it's a roller coaster. I don't know what it is for you, but it's the good one. It's the one that you want to go to. The problem is you have to stay there three days to wait through the line before it's finally your turn, you know, and then it's done in three seconds. But anyway, regardless, it's that ride, and he's taking you toward that ride, and he's telling people, move over, move, scoot, please, please excuse us, and we're walking past the line to the very front of the coaster. Oh, does it get better than this? Oh, okay, that bathroom thing was a little weird. I don't want to think about that again. We're gonna, I'm going to post on Facebook. That's going to be a funny experience. Nonetheless, it's all worth it if we get to be front line at this ride. Everything's going to pan out. And you go to sit down in the front row, and he says, oh, no, no, not over here. Walk around to that side. So we say, okay, we walk around to that side. All right, wait there a second. And then he signals other people, and the people in line start filling in the ride. And you watch. And then he looks at you and I, and he says, okay, seatbelts. We're like, what? Se seatbelts. Go check their seatbelts. You know, pull on them, tug the seatbelts, make sure that they're secure so they don't fall off the ride, check their seatbelts. So we're like, okay, hold up, hold up. I, I'm sorry, I think there's some sort of confusion yet again. We are not here to work the theme park. We are not employees, we are guests. And the man replies, yes, I know that. Now check their seatbelts. And so finally, and I said, okay, we've had enough. Something's not right, and we're out of here, and we leave. We leave and we think, uh, as we're walking away, we think, how are we going to report that whack job who pulled us around and made us, we're, we're going we're to figure out how to deal with him. But we, we think to ourselves, listen, let's not ruin the park, okay? Let's at least ride some rides and deal with this at the end of the day. All right, we don't want to ruin our experience. So we wait in line for the other ride, the one that we're not as excited about, but at least it's a ride, you know? And as we're waiting in line, we see another worker there and he's got a walkie-talkie and he's been clearly on his radio and he starts looking at us and he walks toward us. He comes up to me and he says, hey, are you Seth Bourne? I'm like, yeah, why? He's like, you're supposed to be at this ride checking the seatbelts, making sure people are safe. And I'm like, listen, listen, buddy. Whoa. I don't know who told you that, but I don't work here. Me and my friends do not work here. We were given a ticket, all right, and we are here to experience this theme park. And this guy finally lets us in on what's going on. He finally says, listen, I'm so sorry. Somebody didn't give you the memo, I guess. You don't understand. At our theme park, we strive to make sure it is the best experience for everyone, and we want to make it more affordable. So in order to do that, we randomly select special guests, randomly, no, no bias here, to work the theme park just for the first half of the day. Easy tasks, stuff that's not hard to do, just basic cleaning, basic checking of the rides, and you do that for the first half of the day, and then after you've done that for the first half of the day, the second half is all yours. You're going to have a great time. You're going to have a wonderful experience at this theme park, but you've got two and a half more hours that you need to work over at that roller coaster. How do you feel about that? Yeah, uh, I'll tell you how I feel about that. No, excuse me? That's not going to work for me. Now, am I being selfish here? Am I naive? Think about this with me. Do people, it, what, do fairies run theme parks? Does just fairy dust float down and magic just powers the whole thing? I'm not that naive. I recognize it takes an awful lot of manpower to run a theme park, right? It takes a lot of human effort to make this thing go. So why shouldn't I put forward a little bit of effort? I'll tell you why. The same reason that you know it's not right, because you have a ticket right? A ticket means what? It means you or somebody else paid, put in hard-earned money so that you could experience this thing and others could run the rides for you, correct? So does that mean that theme parks just have no rules now? You just do whatever you want? 
throw eggs at the people on the roller coasters. You know what I mean? Just have a good time. No, you'll get kicked out of a theme park if you do that. Theme parks do have rules. So what is the difference? The difference is pretty clear, right? Theme parks have rules so that you can enjoy them, right? You understand that? Theme parks have very strict, in certain areas, very key rules because they want you to have the greatest experience ever, not so that you can run the park yourself. Now think about the church. Church is so much better than any theme park ever could be. If you think about what the Bible says about Christ's kingdom, the church, the analogies it uses, it says we are the bride of Christ. It doesn't get any better than that. In the book of Daniel, it pictures a kingdom that grows and grows and grows and grows and overtakes the entire world. This great wedding feast, this great kingdom, this great family, it is pictured as the body of Christ. It is a family to all those people that maybe didn't even have any, but you got one now. It is the way we get to heaven. I would argue that the church, properly understood, is the greatest experience you and I will ever have this side of heaven. But if we devalue that experience with law, we've killed it. See, I believe Paul, through Timothy, the Holy Spirit ultimately is telling us, don't lose this great thing you have. Watch out for law. Watch out for that fairness system. See, there are two specific types of law that I think we need to watch out for, and really briefly, I want to get into them because we don't have much time. Type number one is this, Old Testament law. Watch out for Old Testament law. Old Testament law, we understand the Bible's divided up, two testaments, you know, we've got the time when Jesus came after Jesus, new covenant, we have old covenant. The old covenant law primarily is spelled out in the first five books of the Old Testament, right? Right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Watch out for Old Testament law. Why do we watch out for that? Because it doesn't apply to us today. Now, I want to be careful how I say this, but I do want to be as clear as possible because I am trying to make a point that I think is very important. Three basic reasons why the Old Testament law does not apply to us today. Number one, it was never given to us in the first place. Look at this carefully. The Old Testament law was given to physical Jews and proselytes. A proselyte is a convert to Judaism. It was given to a specific group of people in a specific location and those who would convert to Judaism and follow the rules of that location. You go on through, um, throughout history and you come to the time of Jesus, you're going to see Jesus warns this kind of stuff is coming. The Jews, there's a bloodbath of a, of a war that takes place in AD 70 and more than a million of them are killed and even more significantly the genealogical record is destroyed and we have it no more. The Jewish race at least traced back to the original was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. It was never given to us in the first place. It was given to them. Moving on. Second reason all right, second reason why the Old Testament law does not apply to us today is because of the book of Hebrews, all right? Because of the book of Hebrews. In other words, it was fulfilled. The Old Testament law has already been fulfilled. The book of Hebrews, specifically in chapter 9, does a good job of spelling this out. In chapter 9, you're going to read about the new, the new covenant, right? The Old and New Covenant. Another name for that is a testament. In your Bible, we have the Old Testament, the New Testament. Or you've heard of a last will and testament, right? You know what that is? Somebody's will. How does that work? If grandpa's still alive, do we go grab his will and say, ha ha, let's divvy out what he's got? No, that's rude, all right? A will takes place after the death of the one who made it, right? That's when you read the, the terms of the will, right? Well, we have a new testament, a new covenant, a new will, if you will, and that's the result of Jesus' death. The, that ultimate sacrifice, it initiated a new covenant. Well, Hebrew spells this out. You don't have a new one without first saying that the old one's obsolete. You can't have a replacement or new. Was, Hebrew specifically says, by calling this covenant new, he has rendered the old one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. See, during that time in the New Testament, the time of the Gospels and the time when this stuff is written, that was a key time of transition where the Old Testament was fading out and the New Testament was coming to play. And Hebrews really spells this out for us. 
The New Testament fulfills the old, so we don't really need it anymore. Think about it this way. What do we get? See, under the old covenant, they had to have a physical temple to go to. They had to have physical priests to check in on for all kinds of medical issues. They had to uh, have physical sacrifices. You can imagine how bloody of a thing that was. Constantly mutilating and killing animals. Why? To remind us that our sin is terrible and it needs to be dealt with with blood. And yet at the same time, our own consciences realize killing this animal doesn't make me feel any better. And then along comes Jesus, and what does he do? He says that we no longer have to worry about a physical temple. Why? Because we as God's people are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We no longer have to worry about that old high priest of the line of Aaron of the Kohathite clan. Why? Because Jesus is now our high priest. Can't kill him. They tried. Right? You no longer have to worry about killing animals for some sort of blood sacrifice to, to push away your sins. Why? Because Jesus, the Son of God, died and spilt his blood once and for all to take care of all sin issues for good. Everything that, that we desperately needed under the old covenant, we have for real under the new covenant. There's no longer a need for it. It's been fulfilled. Third reason that I, I think is just nails in the coffin on this issue is if you ever encounter someone that says, no, 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 we, we still need to follow the Old Testament, look into that. I knew a guy once that was very strange. I saw him in a mirror. And this guy has actually looked at the 613 commands of the law of Moses. You look at a list of all 613, that's roughly the number that you're going to come down to if you pull out every single command that you read in the first five books of the Bible. And if you wanted to obey these things, I'm here to tell you probably more than half of them you can't. They are unkeepable. You have this medical issue. Go show yourself to the priest. Well, who's the priest? Oh, yeah, it's someone of the line of Aaron from the Kohathite clan. Well, where are they? Gone. Oh, you need to go visit the temple to offer this sacrifice. Okay, where's the temple? Gone. And even if it was here, I guess you have to fly halfway across the world to get to it, right? Does that sound like a system that God determined would last for all time? I'm telling you, it's not. Study scripture carefully. You're going to see this thing has been fulfilled. It served its purpose. And the Jews back then were trying to do it. And we today, in our own weird, twisted way of fairness, also try to do it. We are tempted to bring the law back into the church. Watch out for the Old Testament law. It doesn't apply. Second law we need to watch out for is... New Testament law. I hope that sounds a little shocking. Watch out for New Testament law. Hold on a second. New Testament law? See, let's put it this way. If we look back at the uh, scripture again, in verse 9 in particular. So if he throws up verse 9 on the screen, you're going to see it says there, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous but for lawbreakers, something interesting in the Greek, the article, the word the, is not there. If you were reading this in the Greek, you would see, we also know that law, not the law, just law, is made not for righteous, but for lawbreakers. See, I think he's cluing us into something here. He's not specifically referencing the law of Moses. No, he's saying more than that. Any kind of law, any kind of law, and then he gives a list of all these different sins. Were these sins under the Old Covenant? Yes, they were sins under the Old Covenant. Are they sins in the New Testament? Yes, they are sins in the New Testament. But I would even take this a step further. I would submit to you that even if we didn't have a copy of the Old or New Testament, we just lived here and we looked at the creation and assumed a creator, we would realize a lot of these things are just wrong anyway. Life just doesn't work too well when I'm going around killing my parents, right? Right? When I'm going around thinking, oh, they're just as human as me, but I want to make them my slave. How does society work? It doesn't work. Can't we figure out that these things are just sins against humanity? They are just wrong across the board? See, he's saying any law, any type of fairness system that you introduce to the gospel, watch out because it will kill it. It will suck the joy and the life right out of it. So do we obey the New Testament? Yes, we do but watch out for New Testament law. Am I confusing you yet? <laughs> Let's use an illustration, okay? Think of it this way. 
Let's suppose that if you, uh, as a married man, um, you reflect, which is good to do sometimes. You stop, you reflect, and you think, okay, it happens to be that all the times that I can remember in the past where I either got my wife flowers or chocolates, either got her flowers or chocolates, those nights ended up culminating in a very good night for me. Good, you all understand what I mean. I don't have to, that's good. All right, every time I get her flowers or chocolates, that ends up being a very good night. That's interesting. And so you think, I'm going to do it again. So one time you get her some flowers, and sure enough, it's another good night for you. So another month goes by, and you're like, well, I'll try some chocolates this time. You get her some chocolates, and it's another good night. And you're like, man, this is cool. This is, I like this. So you do it again and again. And then you think, you know what? Why am I only doing this once a month? I can do it twice a month, three times a month. And so you keep it going, and it keeps working. So you're down to every week, twice a week, three times a week. Finally, you've pushed this thing so far, you've decided, you know what? I'm just going to buy stock in a flower company somewhere. I'm going to stockpile these flowers. I'm going to load up on chocolates. I'm going to keep a spare and a cooler in my car just in case I need it. I mean, you really <laughs> dig into this thing. Now my question is, how's your marriage looking? I'm going to guess that it's not looking so good anymore. I'm, as a matter of fact, just, to, just to, bear with me here. I think that that gesture, I think you might get to the point where if you give your wife another chocolate, she might want to stab you. You know what I mean? Now, why is that? From a very simplified male brain, you're doing the exact same actions. Why doesn't it lead to the same result? She loved it before. She was ecstatic about it before. Now she hates it. That just doesn't seem right. But your perceptive wife going to understand something, isn't she? What's she going to understand? That very thing that you were doing as an act of love, as an act of devotion, as an act of just a, some, a simple way to say, I am thinking about you, I care about you, I really cherish you, has now become not an act of devotion, an act of manipulation, Right? Now you are doing something not because you really love or cherish me. Now you're doing something because you want to get what you want. Yes, you're doing the very same things, but no, the motives are now completely different. The same things that you were doing that once made me feel cherished and valued and loved now make me feel devalued, somewhat hated, and cheap, right? What did that husband do? He took a good thing, and he boiled it down to a formula, a system, and he killed it. See, I would submit to you, he took grace, and he turned it into law. And if we aren't very careful, Christians... That's exactly what we will do. But I got good news for you. Not only do you not want to live that way, you don't have to live that way. I know theme parks aren't everyone's thing. I get that. But you and I cannot deny, even if you don't like theme parks, you cannot deny there are people out there who will fly halfway across the world and they will blow thousands of dollars just so they can experience a few measly days at a theme park, right? And we're a part of the church. We're Christ's bride. We're the people that all get to be ushered into the presence of God forever for heaven. Do you want to nitpick that? Or would you rather enjoy it?